Welcome. Thanks everybody for being here. We're so excited that you could join us today for this free CLE litigating denial, which is going to be all about Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison's lawsuit against Exxon and Coke. Today's program is part of MCA's week-long showcase of events that's replacing our biggest fundraiser of the year, and it raises critical funds to support MCA and our work. We'd like to take a moment to recognize our generous sponsors who've made these events possible. And in particular today, I want to shout out uh, the folks who are sponsoring this CLE. Ron Sternel and Nancy Gibson, the Zell Law Firm, Lynn and Daniel Brennan, and the Martha Struthers Farley and Donald C. Farley Jr. Family Foundation all made this event possible. So thanks much to, to those important sponsors. There are a number of other events. There are webinars, podcasts, and virtual gatherings that are all part of this fundraising event. And you can read more about those on our website. We have a special website set up for this week's events. It's at www.voicesdrivingchange.org. You can also see our magazine there. Plan to join us for sure for Legally Green. This is our capstone event. It's going to happen on Thursday of this week, September 24th at 7 o'clock. It's unlike anything that um, we've done before. And it's taking the place of what is normally our big fall gala. So Legally Green, 7 o'clock um, on Thursday. Please join us. It'll be a 35-minute program. Uh, it'll leave you energized and inspired. And after the event, you'll have an opportunity to meet some of our staff and talk informally with folks. So I really hope that you'll be able to join us for that. If this is your first time joining us, thank you for being here. The Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy uses law and science to protect Minnesota's environment, its natural resources, and the health of its people. We've been on the forefront of Minnesota's environmental movement for almost 50 years. We work on the court, in the courts, um, up at the legislature, and also with public agencies to create, strengthen, and enforce smart environmental laws. We're providing this CLE free of charge, but you, of course, are invited to make a donation if you'd like to support MCA's vital work. All of our work is made possible by the generous support of our donors. If you'd like to join us in our fight for a healthy and sustainable future, please go to www.voicesdrivingchange.org and there you'll find uh, a way to donate. You'll also find a lot more information about these events. Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Ruther. I'm the Chief Legal Officer of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Um, welcome to the CLE. With me today are Lee Curry, Barbara Fries, and Joy Anderson. Hi guys gals. Um, I'm going to introduce them each, um, starting with Lee. Um, Lee is currently a special assistant attorney general in Keith Ellison's office. She was previously the climate and energy program director with us at MCEA and also spent time as a clerk at the Minnesota Court of Appeals and as an attorney at Leonard Street and Dinard. Welcome, Lee. Um, she got her JD in 2006 from William Mitchell Law School, has a master's in conservation biology and a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science. And she's one of the primary litigators in the case against Exxon, Coke Industries, and the American Petroleum Institute that we're gonna be discussing today. So thanks for being here, Lee. Thanks, Kevin. Barbara Fries is an environmental attorney and author after getting her JD from NYU, Barbara returned to Minnesota and worked as an assistant attorney general for 13 years, representing the state's pollution control agency. She confronted an early example of climate denial in the mid 1990s when she cross-examined witnesses for the coal industry in the state's first externalities proceeding before the Public Utilities Commission. Her first book called Coal, A Human History was published in 2003. Barbara has since worked in the nonprofit sector as both an attorney and energy policy advocate, pushing to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and to advance climate protection policies. Her new book, which I can recommend to you and have right here, 
uh, was published this, just this past year by the University of California Press. It's called Industrial Strength Denial, Eight Stories of Corporations Defending the Indefensible from the Slave Trade to Climate Change. As the title suggests, it includes a chapter about climate denial by the fossil fuel industry. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today, Barb. Thank you, Kevin. And Joy Anderson is a senior staff attorney at MCEA, where she's worked on issues related to climate change, water quality, and mining. Before joining MCEA, Joy was a shareholder at the Minneapolis law firm Gray Plant Booty, where she litigated cases and headed the firm's pro bono program. Joy has been named a rising star by super lawyers, a North Star lawyer by the Minnesota State Bar Association. And in 2018, she was one of Minnesota's Attorneys of the Year, uh, named by the Minnesota Lawyer Magazine. So Joy, welcome to you too. Thank you. Um, we have set aside an hour about. Uh, I've got some questions for our panelists. And I'm hoping that we can also have some conversation between the four of us. And of course, we wanna save some time to answer questions that you, the participants have. Um, we're gonna be using the Q&A function on this webinar. So if you hover over the screen on your computer, you should see at the bottom of it, some little bubbles that say Q&A. And you can post your questions there. I'll sort of be checking in on the questions throughout and um, hopefully we'll get to as many of them as possible within the time that we have. Also, I guess I should say that um, the CLE board has already approved this seminar for uh, standard credit. Um, you'll find it by searching for litigating denial. The event code, if you wanna write it down is 320186, 320186. Okay, let's jump in. And we're gonna start with Lee. Um, since you're kind of at the center of all this. Why don't you give us a sense of what led to the lawsuit? Um, walk us through how we got here. Yes, thanks, Kevin. So I would say this lawsuit really dates back to 2015 when there was uh, some investigative journalism that uncovered what Exxon in particular uh, knew about climate change and when and showed that they really had uh, a deeper, better understanding than anybody realized and really better than anybody else had at the time, um, dating all the way back to the 1960s, 70s, 80s. So when this journalism uncovered that trove of documents showing this deep scientific understanding, all of a sudden uh, the argument that they believed the, the pseudoscience or the contrary science that they were espousing started to ring hollow and we knew that they knew better. Um, so that really is what ultimately led to this lawsuit. So what are the, some of the facts underlying your complaint? Yeah, so I will point out, and I, I think most people on this webinar are probably attorneys and can know how to find a complaint that's been filed, but if you're not and you want to look at it, it is available on the AG's website. So you can just search Google for the, um, you know, state of Minnesota versus Exxon complaint uh, and, and read the whole thing. And so there's really a ton of information in there and, and footnotes and citations. So you can um, follow up on the, on the documents. But really what's um, underlying the complaint, it's laid out in kind of four sections. So it starts out by walking through kind of chronologically showing what um, the defendants, Coke Industries, ExxonMobil, and the American Petroleum Institute knew about climate science early on and shows this um, incredibly sort of eerily prescient understanding of what was going to happen due to burning fossil fuels. Uh, and then in the next section, it really walks through uh, a turning point that happened when climate change started to become a part of the public lexicon and the public understanding in the late 80s, early 90s, um, where the defendants began this deliberate campaign of deception. Uh, and it starts by highlighting a couple strategy memos that um, came to light describing how they were going to 
manufacture uncertainty and doubt and um, how that would look. And then it, it, the complaint has a sample. There's no way that complaint could include every misleading statement about climate uh, change that has ever been made, but a sample of some of the statements that have been funded by or made by defendants. Um, and there's a section on how Minnesota has already been harmed by climate change, uh, listing a few examples uh, of those damages that we've already suffered. And then lastly, there's uh, a link between, uh, alleging a link between defendants' campaign of deception and the fact that these climate harms are worse, uh, are deeper than they would need to be if uh, defendants had simply told the truth when they knew it. So you're really saying that Exxon and others knew about climate change early on, uh, like we're talking 60s, 70s, 80s? Yeah, I mean, they had, um, they had some of the leading scientists at the time doing cutting edge research that really um, drove the understanding of climate science. I know that you said you said that you've attached some of the documents to the complaint, but you have some of them with you today. I'm wondering if you could just show us or talk about, you know, kind of linking up the statements of what did, what did they know back then? And then um, how did that turning point happen? What do those memos look like? Yeah, I'll show you. Um, I did bring a couple that were in the complaint. I'll just share my screen here. Um, Let's head back to the first slide here. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of these that are um, clipped out and excerpted in the complaint. Uh, and then there's some more that are, you know, just described. But this one here is one of the documents that I described that is sort of in that first section where we, we walk through um, what, these comp what these defendants knew and when. And so this was an internal Exxon memo that was from um, two scientists to a third scientist, uh, and it's, you can see it's stamped proprietary information. So this is the kind of thing it's not, um, it was not wide, widely circulated. It was uh, something Exxon alone at the time, I think, knew and understood. It was, it's dated October 16th, 1979. So this is well before the climate change was on the forefront um, publicly. And then it really, I think I, you know, I pulled this one because I really think it shows clearly um, the understanding that uh, Exxon in this case had at the time. So um, they're explaining to this, to their internal department that um, carbon dioxide uh, concentrations are increasing in the atmosphere. And then they explain that this is due to fossil fuel combustion um, that it will cause a warming of the Earth's surface and that uh, the present trend of fossil fuel consumption will cause dramatic environmental effects before 2050. Um, so now, you know, this is what we all understand now, but uh, they knew it a long time before that. This next slide is uh, just actually a clip from the camp, uh, complaint itself. Uh, this paragraph 89, if you look in the complaint, is where we... Uh, walk through the strategy memos I mentioned. Um, and so this bullet is describes a 1988 strategy memo that ExxonMobil circulated internally, describing what they call their Exxon position. And this was their decision that they would uh, emphasize the uncertainty of climate science and sort of urge this, what they're calling a balanced scientific uh, approach and essentially over uh, overstate the uncertainty uh, around climate science. And then similarly, this is a 1998 memo from the American Petroleum Institute, which is a trade group that consists of uh, fossil fuel petroleum companies. Um, and this is just a small excerpt of a long communications that it's called the Global Communications Plan. Um, but this is how they describe victory, which is when the average citizens understand uncertainties in climate science and uh, that the recognition of these uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom. Um, so those are kind of the, I would say, uh, most damning pieces of evidence in terms of the decision to create this uh, 
deliberate campaign of deception. And then um, the last one I brought is really just one of, of many examples in the complaint of some of the misleading statements. Um, this is a slide out of a talk that was given by a person named William Happer, who's, uh, as you can see on the slide, they're connected to the Heartland Institute, which receives funding from defendants and others. Um, and he's also connected to other, what, most, what a lot of people refer to as climate denial groups. Um, and he's been, he's not a climate scientist, but he is a scientist that these groups have used to try to lend legitimacy to their um, claims. And so this uh, talk he gave was at the Conference of the Parties um, 25 in Madrid. So mm -hmm. COP 23 was in Paris when the Paris Agreement was reached. And this is two years later in 2019. Um, and in the talk, he, he describes climate change as uh Oh, what is, I want to get his um, phrasing right. Oh, a non-existent emergency and a bizarre environmental cult. And then this slide uh, shows how he's trying to equate human breath with mm. power plant emissions in terms so, of CO2. Talk a little bit about the connection between the Heartland Institute and, and people like Happer and your defendants. Yeah, I'm just going to stop the screen share there. Um, so there is, uh, the complaint describes the misleading statements made by defendants um, directly, but then it also describes the funding source and this network of groups that um, were in some cases created in order to further this campaign and make these statements um, to support the uncertainties. And so, and then there's this sort of a, a ring or a handful of uh, the, the usual suspects, there's players that pop up again and again um, that are cited as the scientists that claiming climate change is not happening or is, is not anything to worry about. And Happer, uh, William Happer is one of those um, scientists. Okay. And then just finally, I guess, tell us a little bit about what the claims are that you've made. I mean, these are consumer protection claims. Yeah, so, um, you know, the state of Minnesota is really seeking to hold responsible the companies that were instrumental in designing and implementing this campaign of deception um, in order to sell more of their products and continue selling their products. Uh, and that's a violation of Minnesota consumer protection law. It is against Minnesota statute to make misleading statements in connection with the sale of merchandise. And I do want to be clear that we're not, Minnesota is not seeking to hold Coke or Exxon or API liable for producing or burning fossil fuels. Um, that's permitted activity that has benefited all of us, everyone in society. Um, but what you're not allowed to do is lie to the public about the impact that your products will have on them or on the environment. And that's what we're trying to hold the companies accountable for. And that's why our whole complaint is focused around consumer protection um, and the deception. Okay, good. Thanks for that overview. Um, Joy, let's turn to you and maybe pick up where Lee left off and talk a little bit more specifically about um, the actual counts and claims in the complaint and walk us through um, what those look like. Absolutely. So the AG has brought five claims, which as Lee said, are all based on defendants alleged misrepresentations to Minnesota consumers about their products causing climate change. So there are three claims that are based on Minnesota's powerful consumer protection statutes. So there is a claim under the Minnesota Consumer Fraud Act, one under the Minnesota Deceptive Trade Practices Act, and one under the Minnesota False Statement in Advertising Act. There are also two common law claims, one for fraud and misrepresentation, and one for failure to warn as the manufacturer of a dangerous product. So I really wanna look at the statutory claims. These are, the statutes are specifically created to allow the Attorney General to bring claims to protect consumers. And they are intended to be broader and easier to prove than a regular fraud, common law fraud claim. So, for example, under the Consumer Fraud Act, 
the attorney general does not need to prove that anyone was actually misled or damaged in order to get an injunction. And so that's different, obviously, than what a common law uh, fraud claim allows. Similarly, with the False Statement and Advertising Act, the Attorney General does not need to specifically show reliance by individual consumers. So that's really helpful and that makes it easier for the Attorney General to do what these statutes are meant to do, which is protect Minnesota consumers who it probably doesn't make sense for them individually to bring these lawsuits. They don't have the time and it's not enough money for each individual. But as a whole, there's a large, uh, there's a lot of damages to Minnesotans in general. And these statutes also give the attorney, attorney general powerful remedies that will protect the public. You can get an injunction to stop the behavior. You can get civil penalties, which are up to $25,000 for each individual violation. And an individual violation can be as narrow as one misrepresentation to one consumer. So that can add up a lot over the decades of deception that we're discussing here. There's also attorney's fees, and I think everyone on this call knows that the attorney's fees for a case like this will not be an insignificant item. So I, I'm wondering just, I know that you told me one time that you were on the other side of a case like this. What do you, what do you think of these claims? What's your reaction to them? Yes, well, of course, in my case, my client did nothing wrong and everything was great. Um, but these are, being on the defensive side of these, it's not a place where you want to be. Like I said, the attorney general can do a lot of things that a private litigant can't. They have extra powers under the, um, under the law. And that civil penalties is a really big hammer that even if the attorney general doesn't prove damages, actual damages, they can still get those civil penalties. So if you prove a violation of the law, you don't even have to prove that there was damages in order to get that $25,000 per violation. And so as a defendant, you want to figure out how to get rid of these claims if you can. Mm -hmm. um, well, we know that you know Minnesota is not the only state or um, public entity pursuing these claims in the absence of anything happening in the, at the federal level to address climate change. Give us a sense for what else is going on around the country. You know, there are some municipalities that have filed similar suits, um, other states, attorney generals, Absolutely. There have been quite a few other cases related to climate change, and plaintiffs are trying a variety of approaches to kind of see what works. So recently, some of the most common claims have been tort law claims that claim local governments claim that oil and gas companies have caused climate change, which has then required that government to lay out money to deal with the effects of climate change, building a seawall or um, stormwater infrastructure for larger storms, things like that. And so the claims that they're bringing are public and private nuisance, negligence, trespass, claims of that sort. At first, several states and other defendants tried to bring those claims in federal court, but in 2011, the Supreme Court held in American Electric Power Company versus Connecticut that the Clean Air Act preempted federal common law public nuisance claims against energy companies for their emissions. So that avenue was foreclosed. And so now plaintiffs have been bringing those claims in state court pursuant to state common law. More than a dozen jurisdictions have brought lawsuits against energy companies on this basis in the last few years. And the defendant's strategy in each of them has been to remove to federal court. And while um, those have mostly that effect has, there, that strategy has mostly been rejected. So far, five district courts and three appellate courts have remanded back to state court. That is taking time, and so most of those cases have not gotten beyond that initial procedural question. There are also public trust claims. I think you've probably all heard of Juliana versus United States, which is 21 young plaintiffs bringing um, constitutional claims, claiming that climate change violates their constitutional rights. Those, a lot of those have been shut down in district court. In this case, the District of Oregon did rule that the access to a clean environment was a fundamental right. Uh, once that got to the Ninth Circuit, however, it was dismissed with the Ninth, Ninth Circuit saying that the plaintiffs lacked standing and that addressing climate change was beyond 
the purview of the federal courts. There's also been an investor deception case in New York, which was dismissed after trial in 2019, when the judge said that their attorney general did not establish that any investor was misled. So we could have a whole CLE just about other kinds of climate cases, but that's a really quick high level overview of what else has been going on around the United States. It sounds from your description like there hasn't been a whole lot of success, um, but you're describing tort and constitutional claims. Have there been other um, consumer fraud type claims like we're seeing in this Minnesota lawsuit? Yes, Minnesota really is a leader here. We have filed, I guess, either the second or third one, I think. Um, so as we talked about, Minnesota's um, case takes a different approach, but there are other cases that have done this. So Massachusetts versus Exxon Mobil Corp was brought in October 2019. And that's a very similar lawsuit to ours brought under Massachusetts state protection statutes. In that case, the defendant um, tried to remove to federal court. Now that has been brought back to state court. And so, um, and then now the defendants have announced that they are going to bring a motion to dismiss. So again, that, a lot of these just haven't gotten far enough yet for us to determine whether they're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Since Minnesota brought theirs, the District of Columbia, Connecticut, and Delaware have also brought similar cases based on these consumer protection statutes. What about the tobacco lawsuit, which obviously was quite successful? Um, how is this, you know, similar or different to that? And um, is that a model for what we can expect? Why or why not? Yeah, I think it is a little bit. So the tobacco case, uh, State of Minnesota versus Philip Morris, was filed back in 1994. And at that time, Minnesota was a leader in that area as well. Only one other state had sued Big Tobacco at that point in time. Um, that case is similar because it was also based on consumer fraud, not so much on just the fact that smoking was harmful, but saying that there was a conspiracy to suppress research on the health effects of smoking and to manipulate nicotine levels in cigarettes to make them more addictive. So the claims were some, sort of similar, although there were other ones in the tobacco litigation as well for antitrust, um, restitution, and unjust enrichment. So in that case, it took four years to get to trial. There were hundreds of motions and a dozen appeals. So it was a very intense, very long, very hard fought case. The tobacco companies did not want to give up uh, documents that they had, internal documents about what they knew. And I think that is likely to be similar to this case as well. I think that we're probably in for a lot of stiff discovery to fights about what these defendants can keep um, can keep secret. Mm -hmm. um, that, in that case, I should point out that case eventually settled. So there wasn't a precedent from that case that can be applied here. Um, but the settlement was very, very advantageous for Minnesota, thanks to the hard work of the Attorney General's office. And Lee talked a little bit about the complaint and filing the complaint. I know that there's been a little action since then. So bring us up to date on, on what's happened. And then maybe if you would just kind of speculate what you think might be mm -hmm. next. Yeah, so the defendants here have followed their playbook in other cases. They moved or they removed to federal court and now the Attorney General's office has filed a motion to remand back to state court. The basis on which the notice of removal was made was not terribly clear. Um, just a suggestion, if you need 50 pages to explain why you need to remove, maybe you don't have super great basis for removal. And like I said, I think I said this already, quite a few other courts have rejected this argument and remanded back to state court. So five district courts and three appellate courts have already rejected similar arguments to these, but we'll see what the Minnesota court decides to do. Uh, after that, I would expect the next, um, the next stage will be a motion to dismiss. So we'll see what kinds of claims are brought. In Massachusetts, Exxon has brought a, or is bringing a motion to dismiss based on an anti-slap statute, which is something that probably would not have a lot of success here. So we'll see what happens next. Again, I think this is going to be a long, hard-fought case. There's going to be a lot of fights over discovery, probably multiple appeals, as there was with the tobacco litigation. Good. Um, I see a couple questions already in the Q&A, um, and I think I want to ask one of them to you, Joy, and mm -hmm. encourage other people to 
post your questions, but there's a question about whether the Attorney General is able to obtain an injunction to prevent further fraudulent statements. Yes, absolutely. So talking about the relief that's requested a little bit, um, under, those, under those statutory claims, the Attorney General is empowered to seek an injunction and they've asked for interesting adjunctive relief, not just to stop the misrepresentations, but also to publish the research that all these defendants have about climate change and to fund a corrective public education campaign. So I think those are really interesting asks and we'll see how those move forward. Great. Um, so let's bring in Barbara Fries. Um, so Barb, again, I have to plug your book and hold it up for everybody to see. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Congratulations on the publication of your second book. Thanks very much. Um, you know, we're familiar with um, the tobacco lawsuit as one example of similar, like, denial from industry. But I'm wondering if you could just give us some other examples and set this into historical context. I know sure. that's part of what you're doing in your book. Right, that is what I'm trying to do in my book. Um, I look at eight different campaigns of denial by eight different industries defending the slave trade. So I go back and back to the late 1700s, um, defending radium consumption, which was kind of a health fad about a century ago, uh, defending unsafe cars, defending leaded gasoline, uh, defending chlorofluorocarbons, which were of course depleting the ozone layer, uh, defending tobacco, of course, you have to write about tobacco. Uh, I also look at the way Wall Street defended the uh, financial products it sold that led to the, to the Great Recession. And the final chapter is about the fossil fuel industry and it's uh, defending its product in the face of, of the climate science. I think that the, the climate denial uh, very much echoes a lot of the earlier arguments, but I would also say it has been probably the single most effective campaign of denial in terms of its longevity and in terms of affecting uh, public opinion and public policy. As I was looking at your book, I was really startled by the, um, the section on the slave trade. I don't know if you can say a little bit more about, you know, what that looked like. Yeah, it, well, it was about as horrific as, as you might imagine. I mean, uh, I, I was hesitant at first to even go that far back, but it turns out that a lot of their denials uh, were, were fairly similar to the things we're seeing now. Um, largely, they relied on creating this kind of alternate reality where they argued that they were actually rescuing Africans from a worse fate in Africa and uh, bringing them to, to comfortable plantations after a comfortable and festive journey across the Atlantic. It was pretty mm -hmm. horrendous stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, made up facts and lying, it's nothing new here. Um, with regard to climate denial, um, you know that you've spent time looking at this for, for decades, really. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about who the actors are. Right. Um, I tend to lump them into four categories. First, you have big oil, which, of course, is dominated by ExxonMobil, one of the defendants here. And, and they very much got involved in climate denial in the late 80s, which is when the world was starting to respond to, to the climate threat. Um, the second category I would, I would consider just the Koch network. It was Charles and David, the Koch brothers. Um, David has died uh, last year, so now it's Charles Koch, Koch Industries and the foundations they've created. A third category is the coal industry, and they were particularly active in Minnesota in trying to influence our energy policy. Um, and then the fourth category is this large group of advocacy organizations, conservative groups, libertarian groups, anti-regulatory groups, and they have gotten funding over the years from the other three categories and also from other industries. Uh, Exxon Mobil was a very large funder, got some pushback, started to scale that back a bit in 2007. Then the Koch network kind of stepped forward and became a major funder of these climate denial groups. Uh, now, a lot of their funding is filtered through dark money groups like Donors Trust. So it's actually it's a little hard to know who's funding them now. But certainly mm -hmm. over the decades, there has been a long history of getting money from the fossil fuel industry and uh, using that to support their climate denial. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you've done in your book is sort of, you know, drawn a thread through all of these different industries and looked at 
how they're really similar. Um, it seems like you've identified about four types of denial that reappear. I wonder if you can talk about that. Sure. Well, one of the first types of denial that's going to appear again and again, <clears throat> wherever there is any scientific uncertainty, uh, relates to simply keeping the burden of proof on those that are um, alleging that there is harm. And that means, of course, that the industry gets the benefit of the doubt. And that just means that their incentive to raise doubts and to manufacture doubts is that much greater. And the fossil fuel industry has certainly used that to great effect when it comes to climate change over the mm -hmm. decades. But they didn't, they didn't originate this. It was obviously used by the tobacco industry and it was used in the 1920s by the leaded gas industry. The public authorities knew when gas, when, they were, when the industry started putting lead into the gasoline that this was a cumulative toxic brain poison and they raised alarms about it. And the industry very effectively argued, hey, there is simply no definitive proof that this is going to be a problem. Um, of course, there was no proof it was safe, that's for sure. But mm -hmm. they did it, they were allowed to do it, and the issue essentially went away for 40 years and until you know, most American children ended up with blood lead levels that we would now find very alarming. It strikes me that our regulatory system really sort of accommodates that, the setting of the burden of proof on proponents. Our regulatory system and absolutely just you know, public opinion. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it is widely assumed that if there's no definitive evidence of harm, that it can be ignored until there is definitive evidence of harm, and, and that's a dangerous approach. Mm -hmm. What were some of the other types that you identified? Uh, another one I wanted to touch on is just this notion of, of radically reframing the issue. I mentioned how the slave trade talked about how they were actually rescuing Africans from a worse fate in Africa, like uh, being killed as prisoners of war or eaten by cannibals. And, and what that meant was that in, they could argue to parliament, and they did, that uh, enslavement was an act of mercy. And therefore, they could argue that abolition was an act of cruelty. And uh, that's a pretty extreme thing, but we see something a little bit similar in terms of trying to create this alternate reality um, from the fossil fuel industry when they argue that CO2 is not a pollutant, but, but something that plants need, which is true, it's part of the carbon cycle. Um, and they argue, in fact, one, one group has argued that the, earth, the Earth's atmosphere is actually deficient in CO2 and burning fossil fuels is a way to correct that. And to the extent that you can promote that argument, then of course, pollution is good for life on Earth and cutting pollution is bad for life on Earth. And, and we've heard this argument particularly from the coal industry, but also from some of these other advocacy groups that we've been talking about. I think we heard that argument in front of the Minnesota PUC. We heard that from the PUC back in the 90s when I litigated it, and then a few years ago when Lee litigated it. It's yeah. something that keeps turning up. Right, right. Um, other threads that you found? Kind of uh, oh, around. right, a couple of others I wanted to touch on. One, one approach is simply to minimize the risk. And uh, the industry, certainly the fossil fuel industry has been trying to minimize the risk of climate change. Charles Koch has argued that climate, yes, the climate is changing, we are changing it, but it will be mild and manageable, which <clears throat> you know, is just an astonishing degree of hubris when you think about the, the, the really dramatic and violent changes that the climate has gone through over Earth history. Uh, we've also heard that from Rex Tillerson when he was head of ExxonMobil, arguing that, hey, Okay, so if the climate changes, people are adaptable, we'll adapt. It is an engineering problem with an engineering solution. And to be clear, he wasn't talking about engineering our way past fossil fuels. He was talking about engineering our way to adapt to a changed climate. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that is another approach. It's, you know, the tobacco companies were very good at this. They would describe the addiction of nicotine as no worse than the addictiveness of gummy bears, or they, they once paid someone to write an article comparing uh, the, the notion that you might stop smoking on risk grounds to being similar to refusing to cross the street or refusing to kiss people because mouths are germy. So, so again, a, a very well-trodden path to try to minimize the risk, and I think it's something that has um, been very harmful and draining urgency away from this situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, so there's minimizing the risk. And then I think you also talk a bit about um, distrusting the science. Right. Well, every industry that I looked at, every campaign, one of the first things they do is attack the motives of their critics, which is not that surprising. And they'll argue that they're biased. They'll argue that the system is rigged. They'll argue that they are the victims of a, of a witch hunt. Uh, ExxonMobil, as Joy was mentioning, among those who, who have sued them in, is the Massachusetts Attorney General. When she was first going after them and trying to get information, they actually uh, got permission to depose her, arguing that she was acting in bad faith. That, I think, uh, ultimately didn't happen, but, but uh, Exxon was upset that the AGs had met with environmental groups and science groups who were, as I see it, petitioning their government for redress, which I think is pretty constitutionally protected. But ExxonMobil responded by arguing, uh, without irony, that they were the victims of a misinformation campaign and a conspiracy against them. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that is kind of reflective of, of the history we've seen. More broadly, you see, well, as Joy mentioned, or I'm sorry, as Lee mentioned, uh, the folks from Heartland, you know, referring to climate scientists as part of a cult. We've seen, uh, obviously, climate change called a hoax. We're, we're told that the scientists are in it for the money. There's generally the allegation that there's some kind of a sinister political agenda. And ironically, sometimes that sinister political agenda is still called communism. But more recently, it tends to take a more populist tone. And you'll hear the argument that this is a conspiracy by the elites. So the elites being the government, the scientific authorities, mainstream media, and that they are all somehow trying to trick and exploit uh, hardworking Americans. And, and that obviously undermines faith in government, faith in science. It leads to tremendous cynicism. I think it makes people very vulnerable to conspiracy theories. And I think it is one of the things that really has undermined our democracy and made it almost completely dysfunctional, certainly at the federal level, when it comes to trying to deal with threats, even tremendously urgent threats like the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let me follow up um, on what Barb was just saying to a question uh, to you, Lee. So Barb was sort of describing, you know, the defendants um, basically adopting a victim narrative. Oh, all these people are conspiring against us. Um, she talked about the attempt to depose the Attorney General of Massachusetts. Have you guys experienced anything like that in response to the lawsuit here? We have, they, Exxon has not, you know, filed a, a lawsuit against us the way that they did uh, in Massachusetts for, for trying to bring this, this case. Um, I'd say, you know, what we're seeing more, both in Minnesota and around the country where, you know, Joy was saying there's a lot of these cases. Um, there's one group in particular that has ties to Exxon. Uh, they're called Energy Policy Advocates, and they've been really blanketing the country um, with Data Practices Act requests. Data Practices Act is the sort of the freedom of information uh, version in Minnesota, and there's similar ones around the country in various states. Um, and so they've been asking for all sorts of information about um, this alleged conspiracy to, you know, uh, undermine Exxon and uh, they've sued Minnesota and other states um, that have refused to give them certain protected documents. Um, so we're in the middle of that lawsuit uh, and they're pushing back. They're particularly in my role and, and my colleagues role who are both, we're both working on this litigation because we're fellows through uh, New York University Law School. Um, that's part of their conspiracy um, theory. So they're really looking for information about me, about Peter, um, about our hiring. And so it feels, it's not, you know, it's not a, a legal backlash, but it feels a little, uh, a little bit like a, they're coming after us. They haven't noticed your deposition, but you're sort of the target of a Data Practices Act request. Right, which is their right. I mean, it's a good law that we, you know, 
find is important to be transparent and we haven't done anything yeah. wrong. So we're complying with it, but, um, but there's, it's a lot uh, to, yeah. to deal with. And then Joy, you said that um, Exxon removed and I've heard you say that the beginning of their removal papers are all sort of consistent with this too. Yeah, they do go on for quite a few pages about how, again, as, as both of the other panelists have been saying, they are the uh, victims of a conspiracy to take them down and to basically affect uh, federal climate or to affect oil and gas drilling throughout the United States. That's the way that they want to characterize this lawsuit is that the Attorney General's office wants to stop anyone from drilling or using fossil fuels and that's simply not the case. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask Lee, Barb, and Joy, do you guys have any questions for each other? I have a number of questions that I can ask in the, in the um, Q&A box as well, but I wanted to give you an opportunity if you've heard anything that you want to follow up on. Lee, this is sort of looking forward um, to what's coming up in the lawsuit, but you have all this great stuff already without even starting discovery. Have you, what are you hoping to find in discovery and like, what are you looking forward to in discovery? Or is that too, uh, too I much getting into your strategy? Yeah. <laughs> I probably won't answer that just because we haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know, we're in the early procedural motion part of it. And so I'm, I'm trying to keep my remarks focused on sort of what's already out in the public. We haven't gotten to discovery yet. So, um, you know, I will say that the defendants are also using Data Practices Act requests to do, I mean, it's not discovery, but they're essentially using the, the Data Practices Act to get information from us before we enter discovery. Um, so it's starting at least in that direction, but we haven't uh, started it on our end yet. Here's a question for Barb. Um, you write about corporations. Is there something about the corporate structure that leads to denial? Is there something we can do to change that? Mm. And then a follow-up, do governments engage in denial? Mm. Uh, yes, funny you should ask. Um, the, the book does go, I do go into uh, the, the issue of corporate structure and, and how it promotes denial. I, I, I think it really does uh, in many ways. Part, I, I, I talk a lot about the social psychology of um, how division of labor, for example, makes people feel less responsible, but certainly the fact of shareholders and the fact of limited liability very much mutes the sense of responsibility that people within corporations would feel for the negative consequences of, of the work they are doing together. There's also, of course, the ideology, the marketplace ideology um, that's been in place, you know, really since Adam Smith and the invisible hand sort of uh, assuring us that, that Profit seeking leads to good things, but which has gotten much stronger, uh, it, particularly in the 90s and beyond, and, and particularly from groups supported by the Koch network, which has promoted a, a kind of market fundamentalism and tried to undermine uh, the validity of governments trying to push back against that kind of denial. Uh, as far as governments promoting denial, sure. I mean, they, they can, they do. I, I discuss denial as... Uh, an aspect of human nature. But I do think that corporations are uniquely uh, suited um, by accident or otherwise to promote denial. And then of course, they've got so much power and money uh, and the benefits of that denial can be sustained for a long time. And of course, we're at a time where those corporations can have such influence over the government. Mm -hmm. The worst situation is when the corporations and the government are joining each other in the denial uh, and right now with climate change, that's sort of the situation we face. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the government is kind of responding to the corporate request to deny in some ways. Right, well, and, and you know, in all these other cases, usually you would have the, the corporations trying to persuade the government to deny. Right now in, in our country, we have the strange situation where the, the federal government, the, our executive branch and, and frankly our Republican party, uh, are, are more deeply into denial, climate denial, than even the oil industry is right now. Um, the ExxonMobil continues in, in important ways to deny the implications of climate change for their own business, which, which I think is very dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. But they don't deny the fundamentals of 
of climate change. And in fact, they've said that they uh, support continued membership in the Paris Agreement, uh, although, of course, we're, our government has been pulling us out of it. Yeah, interesting. Um, here's a question for Lee, I guess, or um, maybe Joy, but wondering what the procedural status is of the lawsuit and how long do you think the litigation will last? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can answer that. We're right now um, in the process of, I guess, arguing, briefing the remand motion. So we will uh, get a response from the defendants in early November. And then we have a reply opportunity in December, and then the court will decide that. And then once we're in, uh, we figure out which court we're staying in. Uh, I think Joy said this too, but I think we'll, we anticipate um, some sort of motion to dismiss probably before we get to any sort of merits, um, dispositive motions or uh, merits on you know trial on the merits. And you filed in St. Paul, is that right, Ramsey County? We filed in Ramsey County, correct. And um, what judge was assigned in Ramsey County? We have a question about the assignment. Yeah, so uh, Chief Judge Guthman. Okay, and then County. what judge has the removal? Chief Judge Tunheim. Okay. Um, Let's see here, another question. Have there been other campaigns of denial that have received the same level of tax subsidies that the fossil fuel industry enjoys, even as independent scientists have warned about global warming, warning, warming for decades? So sort of related to this issue of the intertwining of the corporate interest and in government. Yeah, well, I can't believe I haven't been asked that question before. Um, Certainly, you could say that the auto industry received similar levels of support when, for example, we built all the highways in the interstate highway system, um, and the auto industry was, was denying any responsibility for the safety of cars. But, you know, then we passed a law requiring them to make cars safer and put in seatbelts and whatnot, so I don't think it's really quite the same thing. You might have to go back to the slave trade, where um, the slave traders were largely uh, owned by members of parliament and members of the royal family. I focused on the British slave trade. Uh, so there the industry and the government were so intertwined um, and, and certainly the, the Royal Navy was uh, defending the industry on the high seas. So that was, that, that's probably where I'd have to point to. Good. Um, other questions from participants, please go ahead and put them into the Q and A. You'll see a little bubble at the bottom of your screen and I'll get them there. There's a question here about how can I access the complaint, et cetera, all the pleadings, are they on the web somewhere? Um, Lee, you mentioned that I think you maybe have them up on the AG's website. Do you want to read out that address? Yeah, it's kind of a long address. Um, oh, for just what to Google maybe? Yeah, I think if you, if you Google um, the, you know, ex, uh, Ellison versus American Petroleum Institute and Exxon complaint, it should pop up. It's, um, if you go to the, our website is www.ag.state.mn.us, uh, and there should be a, a search function within the website, and that might be um, a faster way to get to the complaint. I have a question for you, Lee and Barbara. Um, it's come up a couple times in our discussion today, but there were proceedings in front of the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, both in the 90s and then um, five or so years ago now, I guess, on the externality values that are applied when the PUC evaluates um, energy generation proposals. Externalities being the sort of unpaid for costs of spewing pollution into the atmosphere. Um, and I know um, that both of you, I think, had the opportunity to cross-examine the, the same types of deniers. But my question is how the arguments that were presented in the 90s morphed or changed, if at all, um, by 2015 when we had the second round of the externalities docket. Uh, well, I can just talk briefly about what they sounded like in the 90s. I mean, we, there were, they brought to Minnesota, the coal industry brought to Minnesota five or six witnesses that were denying the threat of climate change. They did argue then that 
yeah, there might be some, it'll probably be mild. We'll probably enjoy it, especially because Minnesota is a cold state. Uh, they did have a witness arguing that CO2 is a plant nutrient, and so the more the better. Um, they did uh, argue that the scientists with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change were biased. It was a kind of vague argument. They didn't call them communists or elitists, uh, but they said there was a political bias and, and suggested a financial bias. So it was a little subtle compared to what the groups, uh, the advocacy groups have been saying publicly since then. Um, but all the basic arguments were there. So um, <clears throat> I, I guess I would ask Lee then uh, if she heard all the same things. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it didn't evolve too much in terms of it, the, the intervener that was making those types of arguments in, in the 2015 timeframe was um, Peabody Energy. This was before they went bankrupt um, and they ultimately didn't continue participating in the briefing stage, but they did um, send five or six witnesses that were arguing to the Minnesota PUC that they should attach, um, you know, rather than trying to determine what sort of additional price they would model for fossil fuel burning for, from utilities, that they should uh, have sort of a, an add or a bonus because carbon dioxide was beneficial um, to crops. And I think uh, the most offensive part to me was that this idea that because we're from Minnesota, we would we would want the global warming because <laughs> we who would want to live in a place so cold. Um, so yeah, that is very similar arguments to what it sounds like they were making in the '90s. But it, luckily, I think for us, um, they were uh, uh, very much a minority voice in the proceeding. You know, we had to deal with it, but not. Um, not from the sort of main players, not definitely not from uh, our utility or um, our agencies, and then not from most of the utilities either. So you had the luxury of sort of ignoring them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we are about at time, so I just want to thank you all um, for being here, and then. Thank you especially to Lee and Barbara and Joy for participating um, in the webinar today. Um, you know, all of our work at MCA is made possible by the support of donors. And so we are, of course, in the middle of this um, fundraising campaign and would love to hear from you. If you want to join our fight for a healthy and sustainable future, you can go to www.voicesdrivingchange.org. And you'll see links there for a number of our events that we've been hosting this week um, and also opportunities to donate. Um, in particular, I want to point out that we are all gathering on Thursday this week at 7 for Legally Green. Um, this is the virtual substitute for our annual gala. It will be an amazing event. Um, it'll only take 35 minutes. Um, you should sign on and get inspired with us. I think that you'll all enjoy it if you take the time. There's more information about all this stuff, again, at voicesdrivingchange.org. Thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you guys, panelists. It's been great to connect with you and talk about this lawsuit. Good luck. Thank you so much. Enjoy the day, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.